Okay, that's where we want to be. Um, I'm going to walk around, just so you don't see me in one place at one time, and I assume you'll be able to see me as I walk around. What I want to talk to you about today is a new book that I've co-authored called Global Risk Agility and Decision Making. It's all about how to achieve organizational risk in the era of man-made risk. Or in other words, if you jump off the floor of an 80-story building, you may think you're flying for the first 79 floors. It's that sudden stop at the end that tells you you're not. That's the subtitle. What this book is really about is the era of man-made risk. And by man-made risk, I mean cyber risk, climate change, and terrorism, among others. What we're talking about here, and this book, by the way, is coming out in June. It's already on Amazon. And I'm pleased to say that for the last week, it's been the number one hot topic in risk management on Amazon. So we're thrilled. May it stay that way. But I think we've hit a nerve with this book, because the book really talks about what all of us need to do as individuals and as organizations in order to think differently about the risk frameworks that we're adopting, how we're thinking about risk, and what we need to do in order to achieve risk agility. Next slide, please. What is agility? It's the ability to react quickly and appropriately to change. That's the traditional definition. But in the 21st century, it's also about getting to the finish line in one piece and with a clear conscience. Why do I say that? I say that because today, consumers reward organizations that do the right thing, that know the difference between right and wrong. Consumers look on packaging to determine whether it was made with fair trade or what kind of company made it. But it's more than just that. If you're adopting that kind of an approach, you're going to do more in terms of profit as well. You're going to do better in your profit bottom line. Let's explore that a little bit. Next slide. So if we look at a traditional way of business, achieving business objectives, you might think of this. This dog here has his eye clearly on his next target. He's going to devour something. Yes? Doesn't matter what's around him. Doesn't matter who he devours. That's what he's going to do. And you know what? That business model has worked very well for some time. But I'm here to suggest that that business model should change in the 21st century and look more like this. Next slide. This is what it should look like. This person is forward thinking, forward looking. He sees obstacles in his path. He's assuming they're going to be an issue or a problem. And he's ready to make changes to adjust to it. That's what we're talking about. Next slide. So. We're in the era of man-made risk. What is that? That's the Anthropocene era. That's where we are right now. And what this shows you is that if you go back about four and a half billion years, we're at the bottom right. That gives you some scale about where we are, right? But it's only at this bottom right period where we are now in the 20th and 21st century that man-made risk has become a problem. It wasn't a problem for the past four and a half billion years. It is now. Next slide, please. The reason for that is that man-made and natural risk are now intersecting. Man-made risk, we can control. Man-made man risk, we decide what happens. Natural risk, we don't. But what's happening now is that the two are intersecting, and it's causing real problems. I'll give you one example, Fukushima. Right? That had the potential to be to totally calamitous. Fortunately, it wasn't as calamitous as it might have been. But that's a single example of what happens when man-made and natural risk collide. Next one. So take a look at this. If you look from 2007 to 2010, you'll see in this very neat chart put out by the World Economic Forum that there was a preponderance of economic and geopolitical and societal risks that dominated people's concerns about the future. If you look from 2011 to 2014, what happened? All of a sudden, environmental risk came into people's consciousness. Very significant. In a short period of time, it's on everybody's doorstep, and people are starting to realize it. Next slide. So the top five risks in terms of potential <clears throat> impact, similar story. 2007 to 10 and 2011 to 14. Lots of green in the last four years. 
And since that time, it has only become more pronounced. That's good. Next slide. In terms of things that are on people's minds in the short term, large-scale involuntary migration comes to mind. I can't imagine why. And then these other four risks are about the same in people's consciousness. Notice that there's really nothing there related to the environment. But go down to the next 10 years, and man-made risk takes front and center. It's on people's minds. So the question I have for you is, are your companies thinking differently about these risks, and are you as individuals thinking differently and acting differently about these risks? Next slide. This was put together by the Center of Epidemiology of Natural Disasters. It goes from 1900 all the way to about 2003. You'll see that from 1974 to 2003, my pointer will come in really <clears throat> handy right now, but anyway, you see the, uh, the, the dramatic nature of the uptick in these events. And that's just since they've been looking at it. But the point is that the upward trend has been going on for the last century plus. It's not just since we've put other forms of man-made risk into hyperdrive with pollution and other things that have become an issue in our consciousness. Next slide. Think about it this way also. This is a slide looking at 1950, comparing urbanization around the world. You see that on the top left, about 71% of the world was rural, and less than 1% were megacities. There were only two megacities back then. But if you go to the next slide, you'll see that that changed dramatically in the next four or five years. It's projecting into <clears throat> 2020. What it shows is that there are 44% rural uh, communities now and almost 8% megacities, more than two dozen. And you can imagine what that's going to be 50 years from now. What impact is this having on cities? Well, Lloyd's, our friends at Lloyd's, have put together a very interesting thing, cities at risk, came out last year. What it basically shows is that if you look at these 20 or so indicators, almost all of them have something to do with man-made risk. You could say maybe a volcano or a solar storm don't, but most everything else does. And what it, thank you. And what it implies, let's see if this works. Ah, it works. And what it implies is that there's 91% of the GDP of these, of these cities, they're all at risk potentially as a result of all of these events. And let's take that a step further. Project 50 years from now, 55 years from now. If you look at the top 10 cities at risk from sea level rise by population at risk, nine out of those 10 cities are in Asia. Isn't that interesting? <clears throat> that's bad enough. But look at this, that's by population. This is by assets at risk, and what happens? We got, whoop, hold on. We've got New York, Shanghai, Tokyo, Hong Kong, financial centers, all financial centers. What if these financial centers went underwater in just 50 years? Wow, that would be pretty amazing. Let's hope that these projections are not right, but 50 years, folks, it's within many of our lifetime. So let's think about risk management in a global world. What I like about this chart, which is put out by the World Economic Forum, is that it shows the interconnection between all these various forms of risk in economic, environment, geopolitical, societal, and technological risks. We see, for example, that weakening of international governance combines with increasingly <coughs> polarized societies to impact interstate conflict. Same with rising income disparity, polarization of societies, profound social instability. What it shows is that all these sectors and all these topics are interconnected. Think about what that means for a moment. What that means is that everything we do is connected to everything else that we do and has an impact on everything else. So the new risk management paradigm that we're talking about in this book is emphasizing how little of all of this stuff is within our control and how so many organizations are playing a constant game of catch up. How many of your organizations are reactive to what's going on in the world as opposed to being proactive? <clears throat> Most of you, I suppose, would be reactive because you may not have made the change to, uh, to uh, reactive because you may not have made the change to being proactive, but um, the time is now. 
an agile risk enterprise, it's all about adopting a culture of agility. It's all about integrating from the bottom to the top, thinking about risk in these terms. It's all about thinking about risk management <clears throat> as a catalyst, not as a cost center for longevity. Instead of having risk managers going out and getting the biscuits, what we should have is the risk managers sitting with decision makers and making decisions every day of the week. And also what's really important, and we'll talk about this a little more later, is uh, establishing the right tone at the top. We can take the example of VW and how that didn't necessarily work so well. I read today that uh, Tanaka has doubled the forecast for its losses for the airbags to 35 million. Yeah, 35 million recalls. That's incredible. Think about all these other companies that failed to get it right when they were thinking about the future and thinking about how to position themselves. Uh, J.C. Penney and Radio Shack, for example. You can't afford to be tone deaf in today's world. In fact, I would argue, we would argue, that many companies, many leaders in many companies could stand a good, <coughs> hold, good cold slap in the face, right? How many of you sitting in this room are inclined to give your leadership a good, cold slap in the face? <clears throat> Not very many, I expect. How many of them deserve it? You are. We got one. She's honest. You all are, there, most of you in the room are thinking, yeah, I'd like to do that. Who, who among us hasn't? But how many cultures would accommodate something like that? How many cultures would encourage people to do that, right? Those companies that encourage people to think that way are the ones who are going to survive and thrive in the 21st century. So it's all about setting the right tone at the top, who's accountable, who's communicating effectively, and what kind of incentives are in place. Do you reward people who say when something is going to go badly or report when something has gone badly? The US government's doing that now with whistleblowers. With good, uh, with good effect. It's about the organization's core values. So look at it this way. Um, when, you're looking, uh, when you're going on the hunt for profit and loss, you can think about just trying to get in the, in the profit section, right? Ignoring the losses, but look at all the mitigating factors, look at all the risk factors that are operating against you. Those numbers are getting greater every day. We have entirely new forms of risk. Think about it this way. <clears throat> Think about all the safeguards we put in place for aviation following 9-11. Then think about German wings. Who thought about that? Who anticipated that a pilot could take an airliner down? Of course, it's happened in the past. But how many airlines have taken precautions to prevent it from happening? Well, one airline is El Al. They've done that. They're the gold standard in that regard. They put toilets in the cockpit so they don't even have to go outside to use the toilet. How many other airlines do that? To my knowledge, no others. How many companies such as Apple say, when there's a problem with workers' rights, we're gonna embrace it. We're gonna go out front with it. We're gonna uh, 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 revise our, our, our policies to make sure something like that doesn't happen again. How many companies like Le Pain Quotidien, I hope I pronounced that correctly among so many French speakers today, when they had a problem with having found a field mouse in their salads, they didn't run the other way. They didn't say, ah, no, that didn't happen, can't be true, we're gonna deny it. No, they said, this is what happens when you have a policy that embraces sustainability and organic food. Sometimes you're gonna get a field mouse in your salad. And you know what, they weren't penalized for it. Consumers rewarded them for it. Think by contrast to BP. What a debacle that was, right? And how, what do you remember about that? What I remember about that is the, the former CEO basically saying, I want my life back. Do you all remember that? I mean, is that, is that the kind of enduring memory that you want people to associate with? Once you've lost your reputation among consumers, you don't get it back. So I've said that we have these colliding risks. I've talked about Fukushima and VW. Here's something you may not have known related to cyber risk. Did you know that last December, there was an attack on Ukraine's uh, infrastructure facilities and their power sector? 
shut the country down for a while. Didn't really make the headlines here very much. But we've had similar attacks on our infrastructure from abroad. If those were successful, they were penetrated well, and they lasted, they were done the right way, we'd be in big trouble. Our infrastructure is definitely at risk. Nobody's talking about it. OK, let's talk a little bit about terrorism. How many of you in this room are Muslim? Any others? Two? OK. Those who are not Muslim, have you ever met a Muslim? M roughly a third, maybe close to half. OK. Everyone in this room, Muslim or non-Muslim, has a view about what non-Muslims are like if you're Muslim, and vice versa. Let's see what that looks like from Pew. What Pew did is they took an interview of 1,000 people. They did it in about the six or seven countries in the West and six or seven countries uh, in the Muslim world. And here's what they came up with. Western views of Muslims. A lot of people thought they were violent, fanatical. Some even thought they were honest. The other way around, Muslim view of Westerners. Selfish, violent, greedy, immoral, arrogant, fanatical. But I'm here to say, how many of these are actually correct, right? They have some commonalities here in what they supposedly think of each other. But if you haven't met someone from the West or a Muslim, how can you know? And if you've met one or two people, or even 10 or 20, what does that say about all of them? So we have these stereotypes that are in place, and they really impact the way we think about these subjects. And I would say, unfairly. Some of the misperceptions about terrorism. Yes, there's been a huge increase since 2000. But did you realize that 2 thirds of all deaths were from these five organizations, right? And that most of the people, 80 plus percent, who have been killed in terrorist attacks were in these five countries. So in one sense, we're thinking it's far away from us. In another sense, we're thinking it's right on our doorstep, right? I would suggest to you that it may not take more than a single attack, a, a genuine terrorist attack, not with a gun, but with a bomb, in a shopping center or a train station or an office building in this country to completely change the way we think about our security protocol. Imagine what that would be like. Terrorism is pretty cost effective. Look at some of these examples here. For less than $10,000, look what, what uh, the Islamic State and other entities have achieved, right? The Paris attacks, the twin tr truck bombings in Kenya and Tanzania, the bombing of the USS Cole. And my favorite, for less than $1,000, they achieved a change of government, a withdrawal from Iraq uh, in Spain, right? When terrorism is that cost effective, what does it take to achieve what their objectives are? Not very much. Even 9-11 cost half a million dollars. And look how it's totally transformed the way we do things, right? So we need to remain on guard in that regard because it can happen anywhere and anytime. And I do think, unfortunately, that it's simply a matter of time until something like Paris or Brussels happens here. Because we can't be right all of the time, and they just have to be right once. So what I think is required here is that business and government need to think differently. They need to work together. Businesses need to realize that they're going to have to spend money, more money, on security, on revising their protocols. If you go in office buildings in New York, some of them have x-ray machines. Many of them do not. If you go to Manhattan, Kansas, where I was a few weeks ago, nothing. If you go to an airport in Papua New Guinea, I have been to an airport that has no security protocol other than a machete in this century, folks. So that's what we're dealing with in terms of trying to get a commonality of security around the world. Let's talk briefly about climate change. I like this definition about climate change because it sort of leaves no doubt, at least in my mind, that it's here and that it's real. And it comes from 300 plus Nobel laureates. That's enough for me. Does anybody here, having said that, not believe in climate change, by the way? I should have asked that question first. You don't, you don't sir? OK. <laughs> yeah, I've been outside today, sure. <laughs> well, it's here, folks. Um, and it's, it's very serious, as we know. Uh, what you may not have known is that there's so much 
pollution being put in our atmosphere that it's trapping up to 400,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs, the equivalent of the energy released every 24 hours. Think about that. Wow. What is that doing to our oceans? It's meaning that the oceans are really rising in temperatures, right? 93% of the heat generated is trapped in the oceans. 14 of the fa last 15 years have been record temperature. Almost every typhoon or hurricane that we see now is a record. If you look at the temperatures, this is from NOAA, going back to the 1880s all the way through the last decade, you'll see that the low point was here at the beginning of the last century, and we're up here. And there's been about a one and a half degree centigrade rise in that period of time. So if you think about COP21 in Paris last year and the agreement that's just been signed by, by those 195 countries, they're agreeing to maybe a gap of a cap of, of two degrees uh, Fahrenheit, right? We've already gone there in terms of this century, right? And if you think about what will happen if that happens again this century, that's why we have those projections that I showed you earlier. Pretty scary stuff. NASA put this together. It shows from 1952 to 62 the standard deviation for this 10-year period of the variation in temperature. It's about a degree from the zero point. But go ahead 50 years to the last decade. And what we see is that the standard deviation has shifted by an entire degree. It's shifting in the rightward direction, and the projections are that it's going to continue to shift. That is unsustainable. That's why everybody is ringing the alarm bells. What's the difference in one degree? That's the difference in one degree. Ice versus water. The number of catastrophes, worldwide weather catastrophes, since 1980 through to 2015, they've tripled of all different kinds. How do we reverse that? <clears throat> Typhoon Haiyan, does everyone remember that? This is the one that hit the Philippines a couple of years ago. It was the strongest on record to ever make land. Why did it happen? Because the temperature was about nine degrees warmer than normal. That allowed that kind of storm to go as quickly as it did and as destructively as it did. Tropical diseases on the move. What does climate change have to do with tropical diseases? Standing water, mosquitoes, yes? Places that are hotter and wetter than they should be. Mosquitoes breeding as a result. We see in North America, four of these are already here. And this is projected to be the summer of Zika. Welcome to the summer of Zika, folks. And what can we do about it? Same thing we can do about mosquitoes generally. Wear long clothes and put on some mosquito repellent. How many of you are going to be going out in your shorts in the evening this summer? Think about the impact of climate change on human health. This was put together by the CDC, very, very interesting. Talks about the impact on human health in a whole bunch of different areas. Look at environmental degre degradation here. Uh, forced migration, civil conflicts, and mental health impacts. You don't normally think about climate change in these terms. How about malaria, dengue, encephalitis, and all these other things because of changes in vector ecology? This is profound, folks. It affects all of us, and it's not somebody else halfway across the world again. Briefly, let's talk about cyber risk. It's a big business now. Many of you in the insurance business will know that. It's a multi-billion dollar premium business these days. And some of the recent examples, you remember Sony. It was hacked by our friends in North Korea. Their estimated losses were simply $35 million or so. But the fact that they were so vulnerable and that it could happen again, that's a problem. The Office of Personnel Management, 22 million records stolen from, I think it's the Chinese, from what everybody says. 22 million of our government employees now in the hands of the Chinese. And the Ukraine power grid, which I talked about earlier. So here are three great examples of how this is mushrooming as well. The Nuclear Threat Initiative has put together a very interesting chart um, it talks about five characteristics for theft. The quantities and number of sites, security and control measures, whether they adhere to global norms, domestic commitments and capacity, and the total risk environment. Now, up until last year, 
all they were measuring was theft. But now they also me measure the risk of sabotage in the same way. And the results are pretty sobering. If you look here at the overall score of the countries that they included, you would expect you know, some of these good names to be there, right? US, Japan, UK, et cetera. The bad boys to be at the bottom, North Korea, Iran, et cetera. <coughs> but look who else is toward the bottom, Israel. And look who else is near the bottom, Pakistan, for example, who many people characterize as the world's most dangerous nuclear power <coughs> next to North Korea. The point being, this problem also <coughs> is out of hand. So what do we need? We need enhanced security protocols. We need for those countries that have committed to doing things to continue to commit to do things. And many of the commitments they previous made, previously made from 2010, 12, and 14 remain unfulfilled. So, in conclusion, <clears throat> the failure the fear of failure and aversion against reporting bad news, that needs to be tackled. If you've got bad news, get out in front and say it. Eventually, it's going to come out. It's everybody's business to be in business. It's not just the CEO. It's not just the CFO. Everybody in your organization needs to be moving in that direction. It's about embedding risk in frontline teams. It's not just about the risk management department thinking about risk. And it's about being serial innovators. Those companies that are innovating, they're the ones who are going to get out in front of these problems. It's also about common sense. Amazing how powerful common sense is. Remembering what your mother told you as a child. We all know the difference between right and wrong, yes? It's about leaning forward, doing the right thing, all of that stuff. <clears throat> it's also about getting to the finish line in one, one piece and with a clear conscience. And that's the message that I want to leave you with today. That should be the objective. We should all be trying to get to the finish line like these folks do. Thank you. <laughs>